Greetings participants and welcome back to today's session of the Africa Calls Cytopathology Lecture Series. I am Dr. Leslie Lomo, surgical pathologist and cytopathologist at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah, here to moderate today's session. Just a quick reminder for our audience, if you would like to submit a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A function. I am very, very pleased to welcome Dr. Shawa Chan as our guest speaker. Dr. Chan obtained her medical degree from the Fudan University Medical Center in Shanghai, China, and her doctoral degree in molecular pathology at the Medical College of Pennsylvania and Hanuman University School of Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her pathology training includes anatomic pathology residency and fellowships in surgical pathology and cytopathology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. She was recruited to their faculty where she served as the director of the Final Aspiration Service and also served on their bone and soft tissue pathology service for several years. She joined the Department of Pathology at Stanford University School of Me Medicine in Stanford, California in 2020, where she continues to push the diagnostic limits of small needle biopsy samples in the challenging field of bone and soft tissue pathology with an emphasis on multidisciplinary team approach and judicious use of ancillary testing. She has authored many original research articles, review articles, and multiple book chapters on this subject. She's been invited to speak at the American Society of Cytopathology CYTO-E conference series, the annual meetings of ASC, European Congress of Cytology, and International Congress of Cytology. In addition, Dr. Chan has taught multiple courses at the annual meetings of the USCAP and lectured at the Advances in Cytology and Small Biopsies CME course that is organized by the Harvard Medical School every year. Recently, Dr. Chan joined the editorial expert board of the first edition of the WHO reporting system of soft tissue cytopathology. And so we are really privileged to have her speak to us today, providing highlights on this new system. So with that, I will turn that over to Dr. Chen. Good morning, everyone. And then thank you, uh, Leslie, uh, Dan, and uh, Ali to invite me to give this talk. And um, um, I'm a big fan of soft tissue FNA, as uh, Leslie um, uh, introduced me at that. And, um, Today, I will add um, some new updates on the uh, topic um, on the new WHO uh, reporting system of soft tissue um, cytology. So the objectives of this talk is um, I hope um, you can become familiar with the uh, WHO reporting system uh, for soft tissue uh, cytopathology. And um, I will, through my talk, will introduce um, some of the cytologic features of um, many um, mostly encountered soft tissue tumors in our practice. And also, uh, I will illustrate some of the difficulties and challenges um, and also pitfalls in our um, practice. And then I hope I will also um, kind of give you a little bit practical approach and also uh, the routine um, ancillary study uh, to solve these problems. And um, uh, for this first um, edition of WHO book, and um, right now uh, we have two systems um, um, are completed. And you can see one is the lung, uh, for cytopathology, and then the other one is for a uh, pancreatic biliary uh, um, system. Um, and for soft tissue and the lymph nodes, um, we are kind of at a stage of near completion. Uh, so that's why um, my talk um, is a little bit uh, preliminary. Uh, so I hope you can uh, refer the um, the final um, publish the book, uh, which I hope it will be out um, early next year um, for more precise uh, information. And then the, uh, the systems that are in progress, um, including liver, uh, kidney, adrenal, and, and, and breast, breast cytopathology. So um, I encourage you uh, to check your um, practice 
questions and then see if you can publish anything on these area so they can include um, a reference your work uh, in in this first edition. And then this is just an example of these two uh, completed books. Um, and then you can see one, it's very beautiful. And then, um, and then the, uh, they are now available on, on Amazon. And I just a little bit, um, um, the timeline uh, for the, uh, for this, you know, who uh, a book on soft tissue cytology. And then the initial idea um, was formed uh, in, 19, in uh, 2019 and uh, by a group of soft tissue uh, cytopathologists um, who attended the uh, European Congress of Cytology meeting in um, Sweden. And um, at the time we were discussing, uh, you know, we do need a, um, a uniform uh, reporting system for uh, soft tissue um, small biopsies. Um, at a time, I discussed in which um, a professional society that we need to contact to support this project, and then also try to find a publisher to uh, help us to publish the book as well. So, um, so the, uh, during 2020, I think it comes clear that it, it, the uh, International Academy of Cytology probably is the best uh, professional um, uh, organization to uh, sponsor this project. And then at the time, the uh, president of um, IAC, uh, Dr. Um, Andrew Field, and uh, organized the, the, this project. So uh, he leads the project um, since then. And then we also found the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer uh, to, uh, pub you know, this agency also published the, um, the uh, WHO blue books on all the tumor systems. Um, so so it, it, it's a perfect uh, combination. So in that way, uh, we can also uh, kind of follow the, uh, the who book, uh, the histology who book, and then so it will uh, gonna be the terminology, everything is gonna be very consistent. So in 2021, uh, we had a series of uh, Zoom meetings and it discussed a lot of details. So last year, uh, and also continued this year, we have a lot of active uh, writing and uh, publishing the data. And um, right now it's in the, uh, the active editing uh, stage. So um, the rationale, I think it's uh, very clear um, because this is a very um, kind of diverse system and uh, people actually use a uh, very different terminology when they uh, sign out cases. And then sometimes they just use a uh, descriptive uh, diagnosis, but it's kind of can be um, very misleading. Um, one, one time I actually get a uh, counsel uh, case. Actually, it's not counsel, it's just kind of a, uh, a re review of, of a uh, case that patient came to our um, uh, institution to seek a second opinion. And um, it was a, um, a, actually a, a myxoid uh, liposarcoma, um, it was high grade. Um, but the diagnosis that the pathology put on just say um, wrong cell sarcoma and uh, without any uh, differential diagnosis. Um, but in a wrong cell, if this is in the um, myxoid liposarcoma, it, it can be um, mistaken for a really high grade uh, uh, tumor. So that's, that's why it's important to not to use uh, the term even in wrong cell uh, freely. Um, and also, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, cytology book, uh, the cytology who book, it, it will very closely reflect, reflect the uh, who uh, histology book 
um, as well. And then um, I want to mention is uh, not all the entities um, in the WHO histology book uh, will be included in a cytology book. Um, we only included the, uh, the entities that they do have published a cytology book to have the uh, published the uh, uh, cytology features on this particular entity. And I hope the system will uh, facilitate the communication uh, between cytologists and then the uh, treating physicians as well facilitate uh, histo cyto uh, correlation. And it would, you know, all the pathologists regarding uh, their background and that they can uh, communicate easily. And we are kind of the same, and we are talking about the same thing. Um, and then in, in the book, which is organizing um, through the whole, the all uh, who, um, who cytology book, um, so that includes uh, insufficiency, uh, insufficient uh, diagnosis, inadequate or non-diagnostic uh, category, um, the non-category, a typical. And then for uh, soft tissue, we have a uh, very specific term, which is for the lesions that you would consider is soft tissue neoplasm of a certain uh, malignant potential and then suspicious for diagnosis and um, a malignant diagnosis. And I will go through the each category and show you some of the examples. And then, <clears throat> In general practice, um, at Brigham as well as um, at Stanford, uh, we usually put a uh, first general category, but sometimes we kind of skip uh, if it's obvious, it's very obvious um, a malignant or benign diagnosis like schwannoma. <clears throat> and, uh, but I think it is a good habit to uh, include the general category uh, in the diagnosis. Um, and then followed by histology subtype, and and then um, if you can reach a specific diagnosis, um, a descriptive diagnosis will be fine. But um, a, a list of differential diagnoses um, will be really um, helpful for the for the clinical management. And for grading, <clears throat> it has to. Um, Kind of keeping in mind, not all the soft tissue um, tumors uh, can be graded. Um, and then for a certain tumor, you kind of uh, use small needle biopsy. You always want to uh, put a uh, provisional grade. Um, and because um, it, in, the, um, in the final uh, resection, uh, the grade can change. Um, and then you want to put the uh, ancillary study re results to these results should support your above diagnosis. And also the notes and the recommendations are um, very, can be very helpful to explain some of this, uh, especially for the, when you give a de descriptive diagnosis and then to guide the cl clinicians to, um, for the uh, patient management. And in the um, first category is the uh, insufficient uh, samples. And uh, these are the samples um, usually do not permit a, a reliable interpretation of the targeted soft tissue lesion. And it can be um, you don't have a lot of cells or it's kind of poor preservation. And then the um, uh, the um, kind of the the committee consider all these three terms um, can be used, uh, but each institution uh, should pick one and then use um, that particular one uh, consistently. So then the clinicians um, won't be get confused. Um, and then the the courses of these insufficient. Insufficiency uh, should be uh, documented. It can be a very bloody cellular sample, or you can have um, very obscuring ultrasound tail, or the cells are very uh, 
they are poorly preserved, or NMD. Um, this is a very controversial um, area. If you only see normal soft tissue components, uh, which include normal adipose tissue or normal um, skeletal muscle, uh, what should you uh, put it? Should you put it in a benign category, or you want to consider a uh, non-diagnostic category? Um, I would I would say it's probably better to uh, consider um, a non-diagnostic category, and especially um, you are not the one to um, you are not the one perform the uh, procedure. And then also uh, be careful about hematoma um, and without a trauma history. So um, some lesions uh, can have um, extensive hemorrhage um, in the in the tumor. Um, so when you have a, especially when you have a fine needle aspiration, and you can just get the uh, center area does not see any uh, peripheral lesional uh, tissue. So in these category, you have to kind of also not to put um, hematoma in a kind of a, a definitive diagnosis. And I learned um, this, um, this lesson in a very hard way. So I will show you a, a example of um, uh, my experience on this category. And I always need to um, emphasize a correlation of clinical radiological findings is required um, in the report. And then you can either suggest repeat biopsy or not, it depends on the clinical situation. And then this is my own case. Um, in a patient who is 50 year old uh, man and with a um, a six centimeter thigh mass, and the patient had a, a biopsy earlier uh, in the outside hospital, and you can see uh, here is a fibrous capsule, and with him considering that position, and then adjacent to the skeletal muscle, and then you just have a lot of um, hemorrhage and. Um, organizing hematoma um, in the sample. And then they repeated biopsy uh, in-house as well, and they can see fiber adipose tissue with skeletal muscle and um, just uh, organizing hemorrhage. So I sign out this case as consistent with hematoma, but do uh, encourage the clinician to correlate with clinical radiological findings and then Assure the clinician uh, does not be, did not believe uh, my diagnosis. They went ahead and did a excisional biopsy, and you can see um, also a lot of hemorrhage. Um, however, there are few fragments showing some a little bit cellular um, area, and in this area you can see the the tumor cells uh, kind of um, epithelioid. Um, a little bit lipoblast, um, and they kind of embedded in a uh, conjoint, mixo-conjoint uh, matrix. And then on the, uh, so the, on the previous uh, case, actually it was uh, diagnosed by a very brilliant uh, biologist uh, at Stanford, and uh, he mentioned that it could be a, um, a lipomatous tumor, but it was labeled as a typical uh, because it, it can be it, because CD's um, lipoblast. So um, MDM2 uh, fish was performed and it turned out to be negative. Um, so the clinician decided to go ahead and resect this case. Uh, and you can, you can see um, um, here is a low power and you can see the center is all um, hemorrhage. But at the peripheral, there is a little bit ring of lesional tissue. And then you can see here, um, at this in high power, it shows very similar um, uh, tumor cells, very epithelioid, and um, with a lipoblast throughout. And uh, also uh, in the a, a conjugal mixoid uh, stroma. So this is a, a example of a chondrolipoma. And then later on, um, 
next generation sequencing also confirm uh, it has a specific fusion, um, which is very characteristic of this lesion. So I basically learned this case in a very hard way. So I will be very careful next time uh, when I see a hemorrhagic uh, needle biopsy. So next category, it will be the, um, the non-category. I think this is relatively easy. And then you can basically, we see that uh, very, very often in our practice. And very commonly we can encounter um, abscess, rheumatoid nodule, um, fat necrosis, and then um, IgG4 disease. These are considered uh, mass forming inflammatory process, but not neoplastic. And um, for benign uh, lesions, um, benign tumors, um, you can have adipocytic tumors or uh, benign uh, mixoid tumors, benign spinal cell tumors like schwannoma, or benign uh, conjugal osseous tumors such as a soft tissue conjoma, and also epithelioid um, tumors, which include um, granular cell uh, tumor. Um, and then uh, clinically, they can just do a close clinical follow-up or a very conservative resection if, um, if this benign tumor is symptomatic. So this is an example um, of a, a fine needle aspiration um, for a patient, 54-year-old female um, with a, a thigh mass, um, which is quite sizable, uh, is 6.5 centimeters. And then you can see on the diff quick smears, um, there's very little uh, cells that that you can see um, on the smear, but you can see abundant um, mixoid material. And uh, so the mixoid material is very granular um, in texture. And uh, that is very uh, characteristic for uh, this entity. And then you, if you search your heart um, on the smear, and then you can see focal um, areas Chewing clusters of this very bland, non descriptive uh, fibroblastic cells and uh, with uh, cytoplasmic extensions. And also, uh, you, you, you can see a little bit um, these short stubby uh, vessels. And that is also very characteristic for uh, this entity. So, um, this is an example of a uh, interim muscular myxoma, um, which can, um, can um, occur in a middle-aged woman. And usually, uh, it's in the uh, deep, deep soft tissue, um, uh, in, the, in the muscular bundles. And then also, usually, it's a slow-growing, painless um, mass. Uh, it can be uh, well circumscribed. However, they are not uh, encapsulated. They usually have a very characteristic uh, a feature on MRI, and then you can see this uh, perilesional fat and edema. And then basically, this is actually showing you this is a long-standing uh, tumor causing um, edema in the uh, adjacent uh, tissue. And sometimes you can see uh, this lesion becomes a little bit more cellular. And sometimes we call it the cellular myxoma. And in that case, um, we will have a more broad differential diagnosis, uh, which includes a soft tissue perineurioma. And these tumors, um, they are rare, and, but they are positive for EMA and the CD34. Um, however, occasionally you can also see a little bit EMA, a little bit CD34 in um, myxoma as well. So especially on needle biopsy, it, sometimes they are uh, indescribable. And then um, in that case, you can uh, just start out as a uh, benign mixoid spindle cell neoplasm. However, you shouldn't see any atypia. 
uh, in this setting. Uh, the tibia, I mean, it, you shouldn't see mitosis, necrosis, and also you shouldn't see any uh, cytological tibia. Uh, if you see a little bit a nuclear enlargement, a little bit more cellular, uh, especially the lesion uh, is in the uh, younger patients, and you should consider uh, low-grade sarcoma, such as low-grade uh, fibromyxoid sarcoma, or if it's in elderly patients, uh, you need to think about uh, myxofibrosarcoma, um, especially the low-grade ones. In the next case, I would discuss, it's actually quite common um, seen in the um, elderly um, male patients. And then this is an example, and showing you um, there is a, a small neck uh, mass. It has been uh, there for many years. Um, however, because his uh, wife recently uh, diagnosed cancer, then he thought, oh, it's better to check this out. And then so it came to uh, Brigham, and then there's, this is a, a CT scan and it's showing a small uh, subcutaneous nodule uh, in the posterior of the neck. And then on FNA, actually this case was done by our uh, cytology fellow at the time. So this is a palpable fine needle aspiration um, performed at the FNA clinic. And then you can see uh, there are clusters of uh, myxoid uh, stroma material. And then in the material, you can see vessels and then also some very bland, uniform uh, cells. Um, however, if you look at these cells more carefully, uh, they are very bland and then they are kind of elongated. Um, and then also there is a fatty component as well. Um, so this is a case, if this uh, is an FNA from a thigh mass, deep seated, uh, you probably want to consider uh, mixoid liposarcoma. However, this um, clinical presentation, and with all these, um, the cells look quite spindly. Um, so the main main consideration of this case is a uh, spindle lipoma. And uh, as, so the uh, morphological features um, listed here, and then there's a one very important thing to look for is these uh, ruby collagen uh, fibers. And then as you can see here, and then these are very uh, bright, uh, long uh, fibers that you can search um, on the diff quick uh, smears. Um, and then this reflects the, uh, the histology um, features. And you can see here, these are abandoned um, collagen fibers. And then you have a, a three major components of this lesion, the uh, fatty uh, adipose tissue, spindle cells, very bland spindle cells, and also uh, in a uh, mixoid uh, matrix material. And uh, these tumors uh, do have CD34 positive and then have um, RB loss. Uh, they usually have the you know, loss in the chromosome 13Q14 region. And then there are some um, related um, entities which include uh, cellular angiofibroma and the memory type uh, myofibroblastoma. Uh, it depends on the clinical situation you want to consider uh, these entities as well. And then the uh, differential diagnosis is uh, quite broad. Um, depends on the uh, location and then the uh, uh, morphologic features that you uh, encountered, uh, which include a, a, a typical spindle cell or a typical pleomorphic lipomatous tumor. This is actually a relatively new entity, um, but it's um, in the WHO book uh, 2020. Uh, but we are not included this particular entity in our book, but it's listed as a differential diagnosis. And then, of course, you want to consider a more common 
um, malignant uh, counterpart tumor, which is a typical lipomatous tumor, um, or a well diff uh, liposarcoma, but usually it to have MDM2 um, amplification. And then if you have a lot of single cells uh, in the lesion, then your differential diagnosis also includes a uh, schwannoma. Um, and I, as I uh, illustrated this case, uh, if they are more clustering um, around the vessel, uh, the other consideration is mixoid liposarcoma. But li mixoid liposarcoma can have, uh, they, they do have M a DDIT3 arrangement, which can be uh, detected on fish and also now a, um, a uh, immunohistochemistry marker um, has been de developed, so uh, we can do that um, by immunohistochemistry as well. Um, with the uh, collagen uh, bundles as well as CD34 pos positivity in these lesions, uh, you can also consider uh, solitary fibrous tumors, uh, which are usually have step six positivity. And then in the subcutaneous uh, region uh, with CD34 positivity, and also um, you want to consider uh, DFSP as well. In the next case, I want to uh, illustrate um, a, a, a tumor can produce a kind of false positive um, diagnosis on fine needle aspiration. Uh, this is FNA from a patient, 35 year old female. Uh, patient presents a, a new um, arm mass. And then on the um, fine needle aspiration, you can see it's very uh, alarmingly cellular, uh, a lot of cells. And then the cells can look a little bit atypical because they do have very uh, plump nuclei. And also you can see um, there's a, a mixoid stroma. So basically, um, I want to point out here uh, is that uh, once you see a uh, mixoid material, even a little bit, uh, you know, conjoint material, uh, don't jump on the uh, conclusion it, it's a malignant um, neoplasm. Uh, many soft tissue, even a reactive condition, can have a uh, mixoid stroma. And then also on the uh, echo fixed smears, uh, you can see the cells are organized in a kind of uh, non-organizing way. It's not a fascicular formation, uh, but they do have this very spread out uh, uh, morphology. Kind of they are, if you do tissue culture, and you probably would appreciate the uh, fibroblast uh, morphology um, on the patch dish. And this is exactly what it, what it is, and it's considered a, a very typical morphology of a, uh, a tissue culture appearance. And then you also can appreciate some of the inflammatory cells uh, at the mix in. And then for, for nuclear uh, features, uh, they are usually a very pale. Uh, you can see small nuclei, um, but you don't see a nuclear um, membrane uh, irregularity. And then they do have a little bit histocytoid appearance. And then sometimes you can also see um, uh, mitosis, um, it will can, which can also be very alarming, and also uh, multinucleated uh, osteoclast-like uh, giant cells. And then, and also they can be diffusely strongly positive for SMA. And then sometimes, um, you know, people can mistake this as a uh, Lyme sarcoma. So this is a, a example of a uh, nodular fasciitis, and the clinical presentation is very important. Uh, they are usually rock uh, growing mass, and you will get a, a history like, oh, um, I just noticed this um, mass in the shower this morning, uh, something like that. And also, uh, they are, should be uh, small, less than three centimeters, and uh, most of these lesions are subcutaneous, which is kind of close to the 
most superficial uh, fascia. And then um, these tumor cells uh, can be, uh, you can see a little bit, um, many faces, um, it, it can have spindle, it can be a little bit polygonal. However, the nuclear feature um, are, the, are the same. Uh, these are the reactive uh, fibroblastic, fibroblast or myofibroblast. Um, and then it can be mixoid, and then sometimes it can be pleomorphic because they have they can have giant cells and then also um, um, binucleation sometimes. Um, as I uh, mentioned, it can have very high mitotic rate. However, it doesn't mean it um, it is malignant. Um, it's still the most common source uh, for uh, false positive diagnosis um, by needle aspiration. So that is why um, it's very important to uh, recognize uh, morphologically. Um, and then also, um, if you um, have access to uh, next generation sequencing, uh, you can always um, do a, uh, a test to detect USP6 rearrangement in uh, difficult cases. And we do have a difficult cases uh, in a patient um, actually, it has a very prolonged history. It, uh, the nodule uh, persists there for um, almost half a year, uh, does not uh, regret, regret. So, um, it, it, and then the, so it gets rebiopsy a few times. And then in the end, um, uh, the uh, next generation sequencing showing a USP6 arrangement. And, and then in the end, um, this tumor do regress in the end. And then in this a typical category, um, it is for uh, lesions um, that you think essentially it's a benign uh, tumor or benign lesion. However, you see some unusual features and then make the remote possibility of um, um, kind of, you know, it could be a remote uh, possibility of a uh, malignancy. And then these lesions cannot be regarded as non-diagnostic because you do have a uh, good quality um, uh, material. And then I have to emphasize uh, in this category, uh, you have to consider uh, the suspicion for malignancy is low. If if the suspicion for malignancy is high, uh, you should call it suspicious, not typical. And there is no specific entity in this category. Um, however, um, I listed a few uh, scenarios that you want to consider a, a typical diagnosis, uh, such as the ones I just illustrated. Uh, for a nodular fasciitis, you consider it nodular fasciitis. However, you don't have clinical data, or you have you don't have um, clinical uh, the uh, molecular confirmation. Or you can see abundant necrosis with scattered um, atypical cells, and um, your differential diagnosis, um, including infection, lymphoma, carcinoma, and sarcoma, you have a very broad differential. But if your suspicion for uh, lymphoma, carcinoma, sarcoma is high, and then you should consider sus suspicious diagnosis rather than a, a typical diagnosis. Um, so it's only for situations that you have really abundant or pretty much all ne necrosis with very little cell uh, amount of cells, and you, you can't even tell if these cells are uh, plump histicides or um, big pharma or, or carcinoma cells. And in the situation like a pleomorphic lipoma, and you see a possible lipoblast and without um, molecular uh, confirmation, and in, in this setting, you um, probably want to uh, consider a, a typical diagnosis as well, especially when this pleomorphic lipoma in, um, occur at some unusual uh, locations, uh, not in the you know, typical head neck or 
um, elderly men, that kind of clinical situation. And also, if you see a, a conjugal osseous lesion and does not have uh, imaging data, and to confirm this is um, pure soft tissue lesion, sometimes a bone tumor can grow up out of the um, kind of have a destructive uh, uh, feature and then um, have soft tissue uh, components. And even though uh, they can look very bland, um, such as in the setting of a, a conjugal sarcoma, uh, morphologically it looks very benign, but actually it's a malignant neoplasm. So without imaging, if you see a um, conjugal osseous lesion on your um, finite aspiration, you, you, you do think um, a, a typical diagnosis and a give a differential. And also in the setting of a uh, treated sarcoma with minimal residual disease, and then these tumor usually don't have a regular uh, immuno uh, profile that can help you to uh, confirm uh, this is a particular sarcoma. So in that setting, uh, you can also use a, a, a typical diagnosis. All right, in the category of um, soft tissue neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential, uh, these are the uh, tumors um, in the WHO histology book, and these are considered uh, to have a uh, intermediate um, biological uh, potential, and they can be locally aggressive or um, rare um, metastasizing. Um, these are uh, the tumors. Uh, we sometimes on, on the big resection, we do give them a uh, risk stratification for malignancy. And then uh, these are usually based on uh, histological parameters and uh, cannot be applied on um, a uh, cannot be replied on the small biopsies. So it, it is important to state that the risk stratifications um, should be deferred to a uh, resection specimen. Um, and in this category, uh, you can see um, including DFSP, uh, solitary fibrous tumor, uh, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, um, AAF. H, um, angiomatoid uh, fibrous histocytoma, and then also uh, my epithelial neoplasms, um, and also pecomas. So this is an example um, of a uh, finite aspiration from a lung mass um, in a 54-year-old um, female. And you can see it's a very uh, cellular smears, and um, you can see uh, the cells are a little bit spindly and the histocytoid. And then sometimes they do have um, vessel um, in between. And then you can see some cells do have uh, intranuclear inclusions and occasional uh, some hemocytorine as well. So for this very bland um, finite aspiration, uh, you have a very broad differential diagnosis. And then it looks the same on the uh, cell block um, material and with this spindle uh, fibroblastic perforation as a mix with uh, inflammatory cells. And then the differential diagnosis, which includes uh, granulomatous information, ITG4, and Langham cell histocytosis, FDC sarcoma, AFH, and then also a inflammatory myofibroblast tumor. So this is a case example of a um, IMT, and it, these tumors uh, occur usually in uh, younger uh, patients, pediatric or young adults. Um, it can occur in the um, uh, visceral organs, which include lung, liver, and then it can be in the um, abdomen cavity. Uh, they do have an intermediate risk, um, biological risk, because they can recur. Um, the pitfall is um, only 50% of the cases they express uh, elk and always elk arrangement. So you don't have, uh, sometimes you don't have a, a firm 
uh, molecular or immunohistochemistry data to support your diagnosis. And the other pitfall is uh, AFH, which is a close uh, morphological mimic. Uh, they can also uh, express ALK protein, but without ALK um, arrangement. And then, um, this tumor actually has a very uh, interesting uh, malignant uh, counterpart, uh, which is called a uh, epithelial inflammatory uh, um, myofibroblastic sarcoma because it's um, clinically uh, very aggressive. It presents as a large abdominal mass, and it can have early metastases um, at the presentation. And then they usually, you can see, they present a very large um, epithelial cells uh, with small nuclei. And then in a, a mixoid and inflammatory um, background, and then the inflammatory background, uh, they are very rich in uh, neutrophils. And they have a high percentage um, desmond positivity. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, CD30 positive as well, and which can be a pitfall uh, in the differential diagnosis um, for a, a high-grade lymphoma. And then also, uh, very characteristically, uh, they do have a high percentage of uh, ALK expression and then a fusion with the um, Roma BP2 uh, protein, uh, which is actually uh, a, a nuclear membrane protein. So it has a very characteristic uh, nuclear membrane expression, or sometimes a perinuclear uh, pattern. So this is just a table. I think in your handouts, I think we are kind of uh, running a little bit, uh, uh, kind of short, running a little bit late a little bit. So I will uh, just leave it for you to go through the um, this table. And I also already uh, mentioned some of the features to separate a classic IMT uh, with a uh, epithelial variant of this um, entity. And the for suspicious for malignancy category, um, these are the uh, lesions are, uh, you kind of think it's probably malignant. However, you don't have enough evidence uh, to support a definitive uh, diagnosis. And then, this category is uh, set it up to uh, kind of reduce the uh, false positive rate for a malignant diagnosis. If you think, you know, the uh, malignant diagnosis should have a almost 100% specificity uh, for malignancy. Um, so if you think it's still, there is a chance uh, for a benign diagnosis, and then you need to consider uh, this is as a suspicious uh, diagnosis. Um, as I mentioned, if you're suspicious for sarcoma, however, you don't have enough uh, cell block or core for ancillary test to uh, give a definitive diagnosis, then you should consider. Actually, in reality, um, it's quite um, not common. Uh, so far, we uh, only set one or two percent of cases for a suspicious for diagnosis. And um, um, I think a part of the reason is um, um, a typical diagnosis gets a little bit um, overused. Um, and then so in this category, a list of differential diagnoses should be included in the report. So uh, this is, I just want to show you a, a example. Um, this is actually confirmed the diagnosis on the resection, but on the cytology sample, uh, because we don't have enough material for ancillary study, um, it was ended up a, a suspicious. So this is a 42-year-old uh, man with a thigh mass, and on the needle biopsy, you can see um, epithelial cells. Um, scattered around. However, they are very, very uniform. Um, there is a hint of a mix of stroma in the background. So the uniformity of this um, lesion actually indicate it might be a um, 
translocation tumor or a fusion um, tumor, a gene fusion tumor. Um, on a core needle biopsy, you kind of get a hint it might be a mosaic um, pattern with a hyaluronic fibrotic area as well as a, uh, a, a low kind of hypocellular uh, mixoid area with um, vessels. So this is a case you want to consider a, a diagnosis of a um, low-grade spinal cell neoplasm suspicious for spinal cell sarcoma, or you are, if your suspicion is high for a low-grade um, a fibromyxoid sarcoma, you can actually state that. But also, if you don't have um, uh, evidence for um, a, you know the uh, immunohistochemistry or um, a lesion for a fusion gene um, confirmation, then you probably end up uh, with a suspicious diagnosis with a differential diagnosis can be include a cellular myxoma, um, soft tissue perineurioma, and even a desmoid fibromatosis, and also sorry to refer, and also other low-grade uh, sarcomas. So it's a very broad differential diagnosis. And then this um, difficulty is also illustrated in multiple uh, publications. And then uh, if you can see uh, they, it can have a lot of um, hyaluronized stroma um, and a very non-specific um, cytomorphology. And then they all are uh, common. If you only have cytological smears, um, you won't be able to uh, make a definite diagnosis. Um, on, on this entity. And then this is just a table to illustrating um, the two entities. Um, they are have a very similar name, um, but they are totally uh, different entities, which is one is the, um, the one, the LGFMS, and then the other entity is called um, mixofibrosarcoma. It can be either low or high grade. And then um, you can see they are totally different. Um, MS occur in the elderly. LGFMS either occur in the younger patient. Um, and then the um, MFS should produce very pleomorphic um, picture. Uh, and, but in LGFMS, um, you can see that they, you see very bland um, spinal cells. And then the uh, entry study is essential um, to um, separate them apart. And for LGFMS, it should be positive for MAC4. And then you can um, also detect if you can see the uh, first arrangement uh, in, in the, um, this entity. And then finally, I will go through some of the examples of a malignant uh, category. Uh, these should be in the samples that unequivocal uh, cyto morphologic features for malignancy. And also you can have specific um, uh, answer results to uh, help you to render the uh, definitive diagnosis. And that should include um, all wrong cell uh, tumors, which are not lymphomas. And then also um, very pleomorphic uh, tumors can have, um, they, you have also, um, um, very risky uh, mitosis and then also necrosis. And also, as I illustrated in the previous case, and you can also have relatively low grade cytomorphology. Um, however, uh, these also can be uh, mixoid or epithelioid, and then sometimes they in, uh, indicating a uh, gene fusion um, tumors, and then you really need an entry study to confirm the diagnosis. And if it clinically, it's a very destructive, large, deep-seated mass, and it should consider a sarcoma as well. So I listed a, the um, entities that um, included um, in the um, in the particular um, the um, the morphological patterns, um, and I'm I don't have time to go through all of these, but you do have the uh, handouts to. Uh, to uh, review them. And uh, 
this is a, a case uh, of a patient who uh, had a resected tumor um, uh, prior, which actually showing a, um, a typical carcinoid tumor. Um, and then you can see the FNS smear is quite cellular and a low grade and very um, a uniform. And also on the um, echo fixed um, smears, you can also see the cells are a little bit um, spindly. However, they do have a little bit cytoplasm here, maybe a plasmacytoid. Uh, yes. Um, um, and also, uh, you can see a little bit of uh, granular um, kind of salt, pepper, um, chromatin as well. So it is clear uh, you do want to include a uh, low-grade neuroendocrine tumor in your differential. And then you can see the cell block also show a nested pattern. Looks like a, um, it could be a carcinoid tumor. Um, and also sinapicin is positive. However, on the uh, NGS um, um, study actually showed this tumor to have a uh, fusion gene, which in includes the, the uh, involving the EWSR1 and the ERG. So this is a example of a um, Ewing sarcoma and mimic a, um, a typical carcinoid tumor. And then uh, you do remember uh, that um, if you apply uh, CD99, the diagnostic immunohistoc um, marker, and then you should show a clear um, diffuse and the membranous standing pattern, uh, not kind of granular pattern. And I will show you an example in the other um, exam, in, the, uh, in another case. And then also these tumors uh, can have a little bit um, neuroendocrine marker, which including um, synapophysin. So these are kind of very non-specific um, staining. So the uh, UE sarcoma, even though it's a relatively common sarcoma uh, in, in the uh, pediatric, and then also we can see it in adult population as well. However, it still uh, can cause uh, diagnostic uh, dilemma. And then the next case uh, is also um, another, you know, I will illustrate the uh, possibility of a, uh, a mistaken, you know, a case mistaken for your sarcoma. So just want to um, emphasize the cytomorphology uh, for your sarcoma, and then you should see um, a tumor cells do have a little bit cytoplasm and also against a, in the background, which you call the tuberic background, um, which actually means it does have a uh, glycogen uh, in the uh, cytoplasm. And then they should show very clear um, nuclear membrane staining for uh, CD99. And then in the, this next case, um, you can see uh, also it's a lung mass, very large, uh, in the patient with history of breast cancer, though they actually suspect it could be a metastatic uh, breast cancer. And you can see uh, clearly it's a malignant um, long cell tumors, um, have a lot of um, pyknotic cells. Um, so it could be carcinoma, could be melanoma, could be sarcoma, even can be lymphoma. So actually initially the pathologist think this is a uh, lymphoma, and apply a lot of um, lymphoma marker, and sure enough, they are actually positive for BCL2 and BCL6. And in the second um, opinion, um, they think it could be a urine sarcoma, so they did a CD99. However, um, instead of membrane staining, uh, this tumor actually have um, a little bit cytoplasmic granular staining pattern. So, so they actually render the diagnosis of uh, urine sarcoma. So this is just a comparison of the, the CD99 that you should see in the urine sarcoma and then some non-specific CD99 staining in other entities. Um, so they actually uh, forgot to look at the uh, smears. Uh, actually, the smears is very pale, 
And then you can see it's a very uh, kind of cohesive groups of uh, cells and, and the, with single cells and the clusters kind of alternating um, these features. And uh, compared to a uh, Ewing sarcoma, you should see more dispersed um, tumor cells. So this is a end up, it's actually a, uh, a poorly differentiated uh, synovial sarcoma uh, with SS18 uh, arrangement. So I just want to also um, give you another picture of a synovial sarcoma. FNA smears. Um, you, you should remember this image um, with a very cellular uh, smear with alternating uh, single cells and the clusters. And for lung cell, um, you want to uh, do an initial panel including um, uh, markers for, for carcinoma, for melanoma, uh, neuroendocrine tumor. Um, and uh, also for lymphoma, and then also a, uh, a, a screening uh, marker for raw cell sarcoma, which including Desmond and CD99. And it depends on the um, results from this initial panel, and additional panel uh, should add it to confirm your specific diagnosis for a raw cell sarcoma. And uh, this is a um, the approach that I usually use for workup of a small round cell tumor. Um, if I see that, I will look for uh, the background. If I see lymphoglandular bodies, then I would consider a lymphoma or leukemia workup. And if I see um, the um, tuberculosis background, um, I would uh, consider a sarcoma or a, uh, a sometimes carcinoma or germ cell tumor. Um, can have a tick rate background. So then gonna have a very good uh, cores and cell blocks to do ancillary studies. Um, so in the sarcoma uh, range, you always want to include Desmond uh, to e exclude a uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. And um, if this is a rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, you want to do fish to identify a, a aggressive variant of um, a, a subtype of a rhabdomyosarcoma, which is alveolar uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. And then in the ideal world, um, you probably want to um, uh, consider um, the, 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 the following steps for a workup um, of a, a, a lesion which is suspicious for sarcoma. And then you probably want to uh, refer the patient to a sarcoma center uh, for a full workup, including imaging and then a diagnostic workup for a tissue diagnosis. And ideally, uh, you uh, kind of want to have a, a multidisciplinary diagnostic workup conference to determine the best approach uh, for biopsy and then determine who should do the biopsy. Uh, depends on the uh, different situation. And then if you do FNA, and you want to definitely do ROSE um, for prop tissue triage. And then also, um, ideally, um, you also can do a core needle biopsy in the, in the clinic. And then if you do think um, ancillary study is needed, and then you have uh, obtained the material for cell block, and you probably want to think to get two cell blocks instead of one, uh, because one can be used for um, immunohistochemistry workup. Uh, sometimes you do too many HCs, and then in the end, you want to do a molecular study, and then you end up with no tissue. So you want to separate uh, two blocks, so one is reserved for a potential um, molecular study. And then also, uh, you have a multinary a multidisciplinary um, diagnostic work conference again to uh, give each other feedback. And in our practice at Stanford, uh, we do these um, biopsies actually at uh, quite different um, um, and at very different uh, clinics. And then um, in the orthopedic oncology clinic, they usually just do core without a rose, which is not ideal 
hopefully in the future, uh, we can also provide roles uh, for that biopsy. And then most of these entities, especially deep-seated uh, intra-abdominal lesions, um, they are done at interventional radiology, and uh, which is quite ideal. We do loads for all these entities, and also we do, uh, we, we do have course uh, for ancillary studies. And in our clinic, um, we try very hard uh, to get a really good cell block for ancillary study. However, we have not get to the uh, point that we can do a uh, core needle biopsy ourselves. And now, of course, in the endoscopy suite, um, uh, they also do uh, fine needle aspiration in the rows and with core. So these are very ideal. And then we do have a weekly um, sarcoma tumor board conference to discuss these cases. So uh, in summary, um, I'm sorry, I kind of run over time. And then I go over the, um, the WHO uh, reporting system for soft tissue um, cytology. And also I illustrated some cytological features um, for common um, tumors that we encountered in practice, uh, which including benign entities, um, the intermediate um, and the malignant tumors, and uh, as well as a few um, malignant examples. And also I, uh, using the small round blood cell tumors to illustrate the, the uh, workup um, and then also the um, algorithmic approach uh, for uh, these entities. So I'm going to stop here uh, taking uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Um, so yes, we are um, over time, but um, I mentioned in the Q&A that this uh, presentation is of course recorded. So um, if the participants need to uh, sign off, of course, please feel free and hopefully you will be able to access this um, at your convenience um, in the future. And, and so just to um, uh, again reiterate, uh, thank you, Dr. Tan, for um, covering this, um, you know, this uh, up and coming uh, classification system. And again, it will be um, available, uh, it will be published early in the new year, correct? Yeah, hopefully early in the year. We are really um, actively uh, editing the chapters. Wonderful. So actually there are several questions in the um, Q&A. Um, so the first one is, uh, does keratin um, mark, uh, marker positivity, is it seen in, uh, generally seen in Ewing sarcoma? Um, does it, um, how, how do you use uh, the profile or the staining pattern of, of, um, of keratins in Ewing sarcoma to help you with, the, with that diagnosis? Um, keratin can be positive in Ewing sarcoma, but um, it, it usually uh, kind of patchy, uh, not diffuse um, positivity. So in the case like I illustrated in the um, in the talk um, for a, a typical carcinoid tumor, so if you apply keratin, it should show a more diffuse. Uh, positivity. So that would actually give you a pause. Uh, of that case, if this is a truly um, a carcinoid tumor, it should still a uh, diffuse uh, positivity. However, if this is a, a patchy staining, um, very patchy, and then you should consider a, not a, a epithelial tumor, consider a, a sarcoma. Okay, and then just one last question. Uh, do you consider inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor as a benign tumor? Um, what features uh, can uh, indicate an aggressive course in IMT? Um, this tumor is considered uh, intermediate uh, malignant potential. And um, there is no uh, well-documented um, uh, for a regular classic um, um, IMT for to predict uh, malignancy, but I would say a large tumor size, um, it probably would indicate a, a malignant potential. 
Then one last quick question. Have you seen a uh, gist in soft tissue? If yes, what is the behavior? Uh, yes, I have seen uh, gist in the, it's rare uh, in the soft tissue location. And I, also I have seen a, a metastatic uh, gist in the, in the soft tissue, which is also very rare. So it, you know, you, you kind of always want to keep just uh, in the differential diagnosis in um, tumors to produce um, spindle as well as a little bit epithelioid uh, morphology. Wonderful, okay. Well, I think we need to uh, wrap up. Uh, again, thank you so much, Dr. Tan, for that wonderful presentation, giving us a preview um, and the fact that it is aligned with the current WHO classification for soft tissue. So I think this will really already, uh, this presentation will help um, facilitate um, our, our practice. So with that, um, I will conclude. Um, thanks again to Dr. Chen and all of the panel and of course, all of the participants. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.